thank you. I feel very humbled to be with such an esteemed uh, lineup of, uh, of uh, speakers this, uh, this evening. So let me start and get right into the thick of it. Um, from, uh, from, uh, from the institution's perspective, you know, we would like to have seen things turn out a lot differently over, over many years coming to, to, to this point of having this discussion. Um, the, the South Africa is facing many infrastructure gaps, both in terms of quantity of infrastructure required, as well as the quality of infrastructure that is coming online. And we have come to learn a new word over this time called capture. We, it, it was not, we understood capture as a very different term and, and it sort of redefined its word. You know, the, 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 the definition has been, has changed over time and we use it a lot uh, lately. Uh, especially when we talk about public infrastructure. So it sort of alludes to one behaving unethically out of choice. Uh, public infrastructure, as we understand it, and when I say we, I say as an industry that looks after the needs of society, providing infrastructure for society at large. So when we look at public infrastructure, in our opinion, as an industry of, of engineers, it's, a, it's for a common good. Positive, direct and indirect benefits come to society when we deliver good quality infrastructure in very good time. And, and the economy and society benefits uh, as a whole. It has the potential to, to boost economic performance, increase productivity, generate aggregate demand by improving human capital and encouraging technological innovation. I'm, I'm merely making these statements to set the tone and the context for us uh, and the speakers to start applying their minds in terms of responding uh, to these statements. So some of these uh, benefits are societal objectives, which include inclusive economic participation, inequality, which really relates to SDG goal number 10, the climate issues, are we behaving ethically when we design our infrastructure uh, in the way we look at the climate in the, in the mix of things, that talks to SDG number 13. Then there's the topic of innovation and infrastructure and industrialization. Are we really uh, ethically uh, planning for that or is it just talk? And that relates to SDG goal number nine. So if we behave unethically or if we are in, in each of our places not exercising what we actually say and, 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 and we sort of differ from what we actually do, do we really have a chance of attaining this goal of social justice, quality education, decent work and economic growth? I mean, do we really have a chance? And that's the question that I would want to pose to the speakers. So our current atti attitudes to ethics will certainly ensure that we will not achieve any goals that we set. And what a catastrophe that is looking to be. So I'll leave it there. And I'd like to start uh, engaging with, the, with our panelists. Uh, and I'd like to start with Bonang. Bonang, I made a few statements uh, related to a few concepts uh, around uh, uh, initiatives related to public infrastructure. And I'd like to know, what are your thoughts uh, in that regard? So Vishal, thank you very much. I thought this topic is best handled in a manner that we are just real as a conversation to talk from the heart as South Africans to say, but how did we get to be where we are? How did we move from Mandela to Zuma, to Ace Mahashule. How is it that during a global lockdown of this novel coronavirus of the 2019 strain, hence COVID-19, when other countries like New Zealand are saying all 5 million of us are in this together, the 59.3 million South Africans witness the most amazing impunity where this ANC-led government is stealing from the poor, the hungry, the sick and the dying through the PPE scandal. No sooner had the president announced the 500 billion social and economic stimulus package as a result of the devastation, one on the health of South Africans, 
where today we're looking at more than 17,000 people that have died. 2% of the people that have been totally infected globally and here at home. That instead of thinking about this notion of common good, what's in the interest, best interest of South Africa Inc., that some of the people who call themselves our leaders see an opportunity to embark on an industrial scale looting. How is that possible? As if the PPE scandal is not enough, where it has touched almost all the provinces, certainly the eight we can talk about with absolute uh, authority. The president announces this national lockdown on the 23rd of March to say it will be effective 26th of March, midnight. So effectively on the 27th. On the 31st of March, there are already companies set up by people who call themselves our leaders who are getting a minimum of 125 million in tenders. Some of them have never even traded. They don't even run a fish and chip shop. So you can see that the intent, not the consequence, was looting. Add to that two more scandals because we've been plagued by scandals in the last 26 years. But let me just talk about two. Then we see the asbestos audit, 255 million. And the theory says, had the work been done, it would have cost 21 million, which means 200 million. It's a profit. I mean, how? It's inconceivable. So these people led by Saudi, they eat the whole 255 million. The work is not even done. On the other hand, we still have the vestiges of Estina Dairy Farm, where money was stolen on behalf of the poor. So put those three together, just during the pandemic that has demonstrated beyond any shadow of doubt, the deep structural inequalities. When we are concerned that the four things that the World Health Organization is asking us to do to avoid certain death, which is social distancing, self-quarantine, it says, let's wash our hands with running water and soap for a minimum of 20 seconds and wear a mask. And we know that the majority of our people, it's impossible for them to comply because they live in Soweto where there's three and a half million people, more than the population of Botswana, the Soto Namibians was in an area no bigger than 30 square kilometers where 352, 750,000 people live in Alexander, just two kilometers across the bridge from the richest square mile, an average of 16 shakes per yard. How do you even practice social distancing? Instead of being seized and concerned about the well-being of those that are less fortunate than ourselves, we find people who go and buy 27 luxury cars, each more than the value of a house that it will take you and I 20 years to service their board. And they've got 10 properties in center. So we can see that we have really hit the moral low, the nadir as it were. So for me, ethical leadership is for emphasis because leadership cannot be anything other than ethical because Ethics is that branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge about morality, about behaviors. So it's about morality, it's about conscience, it's about principles. It doesn't help to say, no, I've not been found guilty by any court of law. In fact, it's unhelpful to say, I'll use the excuse of presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Back to you, Vishal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bonan. I'd like to uh, hand over to Greg. Um, your comments on uh, what I've, on the statements I've made, Greg? Yes. Um, first, I want to say thanks very much for the team that put this together. And I really appreciate Professor Mahali and Mike Pierre's time. You know, it is, um, it's a very relevant topic, very important at this time, but I appreciate them giving up their evening. Um, I think I'd like to first pick up on a couple of points which you and Professor, Professor Mohali have raised the first concept of the inequality 
you know, it's not the, not the wealthy who suffer during, during this time. It's the, it's the people who really need service delivery. You know, I think there's a strong link with our industry there. Um, it's also the resilience of the economy. So um, COVID-19 hit everybody in the entire, on the entire globe. But the South African economy is particularly bad hit because we're not resilient at this stage because of previous um, situations, one of which is this endemic corruption. Um, the other thing that, that the professor picked up on is that, you know, ethics is more than compliance. Ethics is not just adhering to the law or making sure that you don't get caught. That's not ethics. You know, ethics is, is going above and beyond. It's going above and beyond company compliance programs. It's going be above and beyond the Companies Act. It's going above and beyond the Prevention uh, and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. It's going above and beyond the Engineering Professions Act. It's actually making sure that the things you do are, um, are right consistently. So I think that's a personal thing, but it ties into those, that, that understanding of, of what, you know, how, what is ethical leadership? What does it take to be an ethical leader? Why do we need it? And I, and I think that whole concept of, or the understanding that the people who really suffer are our fellow South Africans. They're, you know, the people who are not getting service delivery, it's as a direct result of corruption. The people who haven't got running water, it's as a direct result of corruption. It's the people who haven't got electricity or housing. We saw very recently in the Zondo Commission that 600 million Rand was spent uh, by the Free State Housing um, Commission, I think it is, and not one house was built because there was, a, there was a deliberate ploy to defraud the state. When they found out that their funds were, would, would be withdrawn because they hadn't been able to spend it, they couldn't spend more than 10% because of other things, which I'd also like to talk about, um, they decided there was an active decision made to um, collaborate and then defraud the state. You know, I mean, these are the sort of things that are preventing people who need houses getting houses. And again, I connect this very strongly with our profession and with the industry, the engineering and construction industry, because you know, we have an industry which is able to make such a difference, it's able to really make a difference in people's lives. And we're being, um, we have these uh, challenges and hurdles that, that even though at national treasury level, people are they're earmarking enormous amounts of funds for infrastructure, due to, I think, three things, lack of skills and capacity, corruption, and then unethical decision-making. Also in the private sector, I think we mustn't kid ourselves, we mustn't pretend that it's all happening at gov in government. Because of those three things, the money that has been earmarked at, uh, in, in the budget and at national treasury level is just not getting to where it needs to be. And I think everyone actually knows that. I mean, people, people do know. If you read the papers, you understand that there's, the money is earmarked and budgeted it just doesn't get to where it needs to get to because of all these challenges. So I think, you know, I think we, we are talking around a similar point here. And I think there's a very strong connection with our profession and with our, um, with our industry. Uh, you know, corruption is a bit like a tax. It just makes everything more expensive. It's every company uh, who has to tend of and then facilitate to get that work or to, or to pay something to get that work. It's just adding to the cost of infrastructure. It's adding to the cost of that product. So it's almost like a tax. Um, and the cost of corruption represents about 5% of the world's economy. So that's about 30 trillion Rand worldwide is lost to corruption. That's a worldwide thing. So that, that's another thing element I'd like to bring to this discussion is that it's a global problem. It's not only South Africa that struggles with corruption. It's a global problem. And if you look at the engineering and construction industry, uh, they lose about 10% every year to corruption. It's about 500 billion US dollars. And it's about one and a half times the South African GDP. So that gives you an idea of the enormity of the international uh, loss, the global impact of corruption in our industry. It's about 500 billion US dollars every year. Mm. So I think it's important Thanks. to understand it's global. It's not only us who have to deal with it, um, but absolutely, I think we must understand that you know, they say, there's a saying that says corruption kills. And the outcome of people putting money, state money in their pockets and not delivering houses or sanitation or running water is that people are suffering and dying. And now that's extremely serious. Um, so corruption kills. And I think we must bear that in mind. You know, um, the whole uh, ethics uh, initiative that SASI is trying to put together is really trying to push that awareness in our industry but also that we have a part to play. Engineers obviously have a part to play because they sit as gatekeepers often in these, in these situations. Not always, but they're often present when tenders are awarded or, or adjudicated. They're often present when specifications are drawn up. 
Um, they are signing off payment certificates or, or, or authorizing payment of uh, various infrastructure projects. So, you know, engineers, by the, um, by the fact that they have that monopoly on, and I know monopoly is not a very popular term, but we have a monopoly on a certain skill set. And so we are at various levels of authorization in both the public and private sector. And I do believe that if we keep our eyes open and if we um, are vigilant, that we can make an impact. There may only be a, a small number of uh, registered engineers, but I believe we can make an impact because of the, of the skill set that we carry and the responsibility that we carry. So I think those are the main issues I'd like to just bring to the table this evening. And we can impact those uh, as we continue. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I, I think uh, uh, part of the intention of this conversation is to not perhaps, uh, when we talk about ethics, it's not to focus entirely on corruption because there's other, other forms of unethical behaviors that Excellent. are exhibited that may not necessarily uh, be deemed as corruption. And I think we might sometimes uh, downplay those which are also fundamental uh, in the terms of in terms of delivering infrastructure. So, but we'll get through that. Uh, I'm giving I'm giving the speakers a little bit of latitude with regard to time at this moment. But I think from the from the next set of questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, um, asking Innocentia to to call them to order as program manager. Mike, uh, up to you. Um, your opening remarks based on the statements I, I have made and, and perhaps what uh, our, our fellow panelists have, uh, have indicated. Great, thank you very much, Michelle. So um, firstly, I, I, mean, I, I absolutely agree with everything that um, both Prof Bonong and, and Greg have, have said in the, in the leader. But um, I think the, firstly, I don't think ethics can be, sorry, I don't think leadership can be divorced from ethics in any shape or form. The two are, are absolutely fundamentally linked together because leadership is about making the correct decisions. So the, it, it, it just automatically has to sit into um, when somebody stands up at the head of a company or at the head of the country, they need to take the right decisions and those right decisions are around. Um, how are we going to um, carry out the mandate that has been given to us by our shareholders, by our citizens, by the taxpayers, et cetera, and how are we going to carry them out in both an efficient manner and in a manner that actually gets the job done? And I, and I think to me, the biggest problem we have in South Africa is that um, if we unpack the South African economy, um, we have a mining sector, which is always um, at the mercy of international global commodity cycles. It can, the price of gold or the price of platinum can fluctuate. Um, it's almost entirely out of our control. We have a tourism industry which is competing against every other country in the world who's looking to um, have people come and spend their hard-earned um, savings in South Africa. Um, we have a manufacturing ex um, sector which has largely been obliterated over the years. But the one sector that truly can contribute to job creation in South Africa as a consequence of job creation to improvements in, general, in GDP is the infrastructure sector. Um, we, we have a sector that was once upon a time the, the envy of most of the world, it, and not just um, South Africa or in Africa. We sent our engineering companies overseas to build um, airports in Dubai. We sent them overseas to build high-rise hotels in Dubai. We, um, we really had a, a sector that we could be extremely proud of and employed a huge number of people. So we have a situation in South Africa where we allocate something like $850 billion South African rent on our medium term budget framework every year. So over a three year rolling window for infrastructure. Um, and what we've discovered over the last 20 or 15 years in particular is that very little of that money actually gets spent. So it has a double consequence. It doesn't create the jobs because people are not employed, but sectors like the construction industry have largely um, disappeared because they have not been um, the projects that are rolling out in order to, to, to keep the, the sector moving. And most of that can probably be directly attributed to corruption. So while I accept that, that you know, um, you, you said a minute ago, Michelle, that we shouldn't only focus on corruption, corruption sort of becomes the heart of the, of the leadership discussion. If we make corrupt leadership decisions, what happens, we make the wrong choices. We, we make choices for very particular reasons. Um, we choose 
for example, we might choose to continue building coal-fired um, power stations instead of renewable energy projects, which might have a long-term cons consequence on the SDGs that you've spoken about. And I'm very cognizant of the, the dilemma that we sit with in South Africa, where we are a coal-heavy country. We, we need to be cognizant of, of transitioning, but everybody else in the world has faced this issue of job transitions as we move from a fossil fuel-based economy to maybe a more uh, clean energy economy. But all of those leadership decisions are almost being perverted by the fact that we are focusing entirely on corrupt procurement practices and pro procurement methodologies. And therefore, we are not creating the jobs. The construction industry has the ability, in my personal opinion, to create way more jobs than by pumping money into the mining se sector, any form of subsidies that could be um, pumped in to try to prop up sectors could be better spent merely procuring properly and going ahead with the infrastructure program, which is infinite. I mean, it truly, we, the 850 billion um, is, is merely the government's allocation to infrastructure. What infrastructure also has the ability to do is to create a gearing effect. So in other words, for every um, $10 that the government, that the country commits and invests in infrastructure, we can probably raise 50, 60 times more money, or sorry, I, I beg your pardon, five or six times more money um, to leverage that, that kind of investment. So the, the consequential effects on economic growth are just beyond comprehension. That would have created the social housing, the water, fixing the water problem, fixing the energy problems, et cetera. Um, and, and so unfortunately, the, the, the leadership problem really is at the heart of why we have done so poorly um, in, in terms of economic growth. I call that thought. I've got, I've got one more question for you, and then we proceed to the next one. Uh, with regard to public procurement, um, I, 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 I'd like to ask you the question, does it make it particularly prone to corruption, namely bribery, policy capture to some extent, embezzlement, abuse of functions, uh, and trading in influence uh, are common examples of unethical acts, um, although the legal and exact definition of these sometimes can vary. Um, can we conclude that these unethical acts are, are now common in, in, in our country? I mean, I, I know it's a lot in the press, and sometimes they say don't, read, you know, don't believe everything you read, but can we, can we agree that Corruption is as rife as we, you know, get a sense that it is, or is it a feeling or an emotion or? I think it's absolutely as corrupt. And, and I mean, this is, you know, there, there is a, a massive fear in the world at the moment about fake media, but it, it has become very obvious over the last, I, I guess, five or six years in particular, the number of investigations that have identified the funds that have flowed running into hundreds of billions of US dollars. There, there can be no question that it is, it is almost the embedded ethic of every single state-owned enterprise. We, we're not aware of a single state-owned enterprise that has not been rife with corruption. So classically what has happened, I guess, is at a transnet or an ESCOM, um, at a very senior executive level, you will engage in, um, in multi, multi, multi-billion dollar um, acts of corruption, the optimum coal mining procurement piece, et cetera, are just well-publicized examples. But what seems to happen is that if the leadership starts, it filters through into the entire organization. So to the point where the guy that's ordering the, the, the station on a weekly basis is paying somebody to overinflate prices and paying kickbacks. And I, and I mean, it's, it's not anecdotal anymore. The evidence is amazing. We, we are aware that the National Prosecuting Authority has been building its case on the back of Zondo. But and, and maybe a lot of people have been very frustrated over the last two years as to why we have not seen more prosecutions. But um, I, I really do believe that politically, if you, if you get it wrong, if you prosecute with a weak or inferior national prosecuting agency and you fail once um, and a case is kicked out, you will almost send a message to the rogues that it is now time to carry on with the, with the pillaging because you will not be prosecuted. And if you are prosecuted, you'll get off scot-free. So it is absolutely in, endemic. Um, I know part of the question that will come through later are, you know, is it only in the public sector? Is it only in the private sector? Unfortunately, it's a culture and it extends across. It, it takes both parties. When you're procuring big scale infrastructure or you're buying pencils or stationery for the company, 
it's around that culture of saying, I have an entitlement and, and, and basically I, I believe it's a culture of saying, I will not be caught, so therefore I can get away with it. Um, it's like jumping the robot at two o'clock in the morning. I won't get caught. Um, I can proceed, but I, I, it's absolutely right. And it, it's at a pandemic stage in South Africa. Well, thank you, Mike. So, Bonang, I'd like to ask you this, this question. You know, it's, uh, it, it relates back to what, you know, on the back of what Mike has indicated. And, and you spoke about leaders and, 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 the, and leadership. Why, why do you think there are so many leaders that do not seem to care that, that unethical behavior is hurting so many millions of people? I, I still, you know, it, it seems difficult for me to fathom that, you know, I, 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 maybe I'm, I'm, I'm naive or altruistic because I always like to believe good in people. But we seem to have a, you know, a state where there's so many people um, that don't seem to care that you know, there are millions being hurt by unethical behavior. What, what, what is your comment to that? Uh, why am I missing the plot in this? Thing? I, also have I think you are. Yes, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Prof. Yes. Vishal, am I on? Yes. Sorry, Mike. I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to come back. I thought Vishal directed directly to me. Otherwise, I would never um, interrupt. So, so yeah, Vishal, I think, yeah. So I think what happens is for corruption to take root, it needs two things. Initially, it's the leadership that we call the inner circle, the Premier League, the province of the Orange Free State. Um, Eastern Cape and Pumalana. And then it needs a second layer, which is a broader circle of influence so that it then permeates. And it does three things. First of all, it affects systems and processes. We then start using the language that says corruption is not only endemic, it has now become systemic. It is now a way of doing business. It's a way of life like in some countries where you can't even get your passport stamped uh, without bribery. You can't get a driver's license without putting an extra page. It becomes systemic. The second thing that it does is that it needs and leads to a culture. So it's no more than the thought and the habit and the character but the environment now becomes fertile. Everybody says, I, I have a fear of missing out if I don't do it because everybody else does it. Therefore, it enters this self-perpetuating vicious cycle. Lastly, we have seen not only in Africa, but in other parts of the world, where the sitting leader now uses the military to instill fear in the people to perpetuate uh, the dictatorship, which is another form of corruption and another form of unethical behavior. Let me conclude by saying, all of this, Vishal, says to us, we should have listened, three things, to our compatriots in the rest of the continent when they said, this ANC-led government, when it takes over, just like the rest of our leaders, they are going to rob you blind. Number two, they said to us, even the good guys, left on their own, eventually become the bad guys. Lastly, they said, you need a vibrant opposition to keep the good guys in check. You need that system of checks and balances because otherwise they will subvert even the best constitution in the world. Vishal, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, to you and then Greg. Thank you. And, and Professor, my apologies. I, I was actually about to suggest to Vishal that you would be better, um, it would be far more appropriate for you to answer that about how this culture evolves. But I think that that's exactly correct. Good people become bad when they're left unchecked. So the ability to have checks and balances. So unfortunately, I'm probably the only accountant sitting around the table. But in basic, in Auditing 101, you start to learn about the checks and balances that are needed to prevent fraud or irregularity, the two, two major reasons for, for misappropriations of funds. And simple processes of double checks are critical. 
So without, um, so when a board of directors, the inner circle that the prof referred to says, um, I'm going to appoint, I'm the, the head of Transnet and I'm going to appoint my, um, or, or sorry, I, I enter into a relationship with my chief financial officer and I say, there are some extremely lucrative contracts for some um, foreign locomotives to be procured for the country. Um, how about we work out how to um, earn a bit of cash from this? The scale that is being, is being brought to bear, is particularly with infrastructure, unfortunately, you're dealing with such mega billion rand dollar projects that the, that the greed factor says, I, I can do it once, I can take $10 million, $5 million, a million dollars off the table in one transaction. That is more money that I can potentially earn in my entire lifetime. So I will, um, so we have to do it. So I call in two or three people and I say, well, we're gonna take $10 million. Let's, let's you know, share this pot out. So all we need to do is we need to have two signatories and the ability to override when, when you have collusion is incredible. But I, I truly think it is the scale at which money became available. Um, when certain Indian gentlemen arrived and they started uh, corrupting people, and, and I apologize, I, I did not mean that in any way to, um, I, I merely meant to insinuate the two um, Gupta brothers. Um, when that happened, one hour later, um, people started being offered sums that they could never hope to achieve in a, in a lifetime of working as a civil engineer, as a financial director, et cetera. And so they started to say, we have to secure this. This, this is our, our path to riches. Let's collude. And, and that then starts the path. Um, immediately, systems were broken down. So within the Zuma government, the Zuma government started to dismember um, all of the institutions, the prosecuting authorities, the scorpions, the, spe the special investigation units. So you start disbanding either internally in a private co co corporation, your internal audit functions, or you get hold of your auditors and you bring the auditors on board. So we had scandals involving companies that we would believe ordinarily to be extremely ethical, whether it was KPMG or McKinsey. And suddenly you, you find one person that you can offer a number that is that big that he becomes absolutely unable to um, resist. And once you've taken that first, that first sum of money, uh, I, I believe the gates are open. After that, you, you just infinitely, firstly, if the person who's offered you the bribe says to you, well, I want you to do one more deal, you can't turn around and say, no, I won't do one more deal because I'll say to you, well, if you don't, I'm going to tell people that you've, you've taken money the first time. Um, and secondly, it, it, I think it just, it's human nature that you've committed that first terrible act and you're guilty and you feel guilty. But the second time it's easier, the third time it's easier. And that became absolutely endemic in, in South Africa. Thanks, Mike. Greg, I'd like to ask this, uh, another question uh, to you. you know, Mike, I'm, I'm not uh, an accountant by, by any means. I will never profess to be one. But, uh, but by little understanding of, of the flow of money, uh, it's, it's sort of like a commodity. It flows globally you know, uh, through various mechanisms of institutions, reserve banks, uh, central banks, shift money globally. Now, when you, when you have uh, you know, money sort of deviating from the normal way that it should have been, you know, flowing by way of this conversation called corruption. What, where does it go? Because they must be, it can't disappear from the, you know, is it disappearing from the economy? Because what I can't understand, it should still have a multiplier effect if, if it is sitting in the hands of, of, of people that shouldn't, you know, ordinarily have it, but surely they're still spending it on something so it does have an economic benefit. I'm just asking the question. Okay, it sounds uh, you know, illiterate probably, but where does it go? Because it seems like we have nothing to show for it. Um, and I'm sure it can't disappear. So Greg, do you have any insights into, into how, this, how this money flows? Because it seems to have stopped flowing, if you ask me. Uh, I'm sorry. Like back to German sorry, just just yes. before you you jump in, Greg, just doing a time check. Uh, we just have about only 15 minutes for, for this interactive discussion. So okay. it's our answers shorter. Thank you. Well, if I'm being facetious, I might say that it goes to the German automakers. But you know, I mean, a lot of it, and we've seen that with other um, 
leaders who are, who are infamous for putting their money into foreign bank accounts. You know, look, I think in you know, Dubai or Switzerland or, or the Cayman Islands, look, I do think the money, it, I, do, I don't think it, it, uh, it remains in the economy. Some of it might, but I, I honestly don't think much of it, much of it does. Um, but, I, but I would also like to just um, pick up on those, on that point about, um, you know, corruption leads to massive changes in policy. So, I mean, the energy uh, debate is a, is a significant debate. You know, was it nuclear? Was it coal-fired? Or was it going to be renewable? And I think, you know, that sort of thing, it, it has generational impact on a country. It's your grandchildren that are going to be affected by the decisions that are made. And if it's been made on, a, on the basis of how much money I could put in my pocket today, um, then that's not good long-term thinking. It's not sustainable. And, you know, the concept of sustainability is picked up quite strongly in the King Code um, of sustainable businesses, of operating in the interests of the bottom line, economically and socially, the impact that, that these decisions make. And I honestly think sustainability is a sort of a watchword that we should keep in mind because it does bring a, balance, a balanced response, whether it's in the public sector making decisions about energy policy or housing policy, or in the business sector, the private sector, are they, are they making ethical decisions which are, which are more balanced and uh, more sustainable in the long term. And I think those sorts of things, you know, an unsustainable business doesn't help anyone. It eventually has to get rid of its uh, employees. It may score one contract, but it's not gonna get any repeat business once people find out. And you've seen the list of people or the list of companies that have fallen. Um, and I agree with, with my, what Mike is saying is this culture and it's kind, of, it's kind of pervasive. It has become pervasive. And I think it's, um, it's very important to, just to, to, to consider the sustainability of the decisions we make, whether it's, in the private or public sector. The other question you asked was like, where does the money go? I think I also read an interesting uh, paragraph earlier today, which talked about, um, you know, capital will flow where it gets the best return effectively. And if corruption is adding a 10% cost, an additional tax, if you're not getting return on investment, capital will flow elsewhere, basically. And that's not a corruption thing. That's, that's the external investment. It's not coming here because they're not getting the returns they want um, based on the risk, on the perceived risk. I think that's a significant thing to think about. You know, we're making our country less and less attractive to external investment. Thank you. Innocentia? Yeah, so my, my question is directed to Prof. Bonang. You know, you, you touched on systematic and ethical behavior. Would you say that we the point of no return we still do better um, as a nation is the opportunity to to swing the tide Prof Bonang? Um, sis innocentia you were breaking up every other second word but the gist of your question if i understood have we reached a point of no return the answer is no because South Africans, we are resilient. Resilience is much more than sustainability, especially in Africa, because it's much more than the food, water, energy nexus. No, because as South Africans, we are nice people, but we don't think twice about standing up against something that's not working. So during apartheid, all of us, black and white, male and female, young and old, had a singularity of purpose to say apartheid is a crime against humanity. That's why in 100 years, apartheid was killed. It still lives in the minds of a few, but by and large, 59.3 million South Africans are free. So what we need going forward may not say as I conclude, we need a new common enemy. This notion of common purpose, what's in the best interest of South Africa, not just my personal best interest. The difference between a statesman and a politician is that the politician is thinking about the next election. A statesman is thinking about the next generation. All of us need to start thinking about the foundations we are laying one brick at a time for our grandchildren. Because every leader must be seized 
passionately with this question, how do I leave this company, this country, this earth in a substantially better position than I found it in? Thank you, Maino Sanchez. Thank you. I've got one more question and then we'll have closing remarks. The, the one question that I have is, if we remember when the, when the pandemic hit us and when we had the lockdown, as you mentioned in, in March, and this question goes out to the three panelists and then we'll close, is uh, we, were, we were sort of commended as a country for the way we dealt with the pandemic. The initiatives we put into place, PPP scandal or PPE scandals aside, but the way we dealt with the pandemic, we were in the top four of the world in our, in our, our sort of proactiveness in dealing with the pandemic, the lockdown, the hard and fast compliance, and all of these things, you know, sort of allowed us to get on top of it within five months, where we saw this infection rate drop, we saw compliance to, there was obviously non-compliance, but we saw compliance generally, we see the infections, and we seem, we may or may not have the second wave next year, but we're not sure what, you know, what the scale of that would be, uh, but that's just because we've, uh, you know, unlocked the economy maybe earlier than we should have, but there was reasons for that. So what I'm getting to is, our ability to deal with the pandemic seemed absolutely perfect in my mind uh, as a country in the way we dealt with COVID. Why do we not acknowledge that this corruption is a similar scale, if not greater, pandemic, and we seem to not want to do the same and treat it with the urgency that is required, similar to COVID? That's the question. Um, Mike, maybe you first. Bonang uh, spoke last. And uh, let's finish off with Bonang on that one, and then we'll have closing remarks. So, so again, I, I mean, Michelle, everything goes to the heart of, of this leadership question. The, the institution that is responsible for driving leadership in South Africa is, is the ANC party, unfortunately. The lack of a strong and effective opposition, um, in fact, um, an abysmally poor opposition, just enables the ANC to do what it likes. Um, again, uh, I think it's a very long debate, but the, the constitutional um, manner in which the country is run, allowing the a party to elect the leadership and then giving incredible powers to that leader once he's in power, um, lends itself to this particular flaw. I mean, that, to my mind, is the fundamental problem. I think at the time it was never envisaged that you could never have sufficient opposition to put the checks and balances in place. So um, the single way to, to, to write the, the system, and I don't know how you do that constitutionally, is would be for there to be better questioning opposition. People in power in your opposition um, who, who put up the ethic, who, who adhere to the ethical leadership principles. Um, people who come with a reputation of doing the right things. And that is massively lacking in South Africa in general. If we look at some of the other opposition parties, um, people in, in leadership positions accused of corruption, you, you're on a hiding to nowhere at the, at the very outset. Thank you, Mike. Greg? No, look, I think that's a very big question. If, I think, you know, Parliament was able in that situation to afford uh, certain powers to the, to the president. I also think that, personally, I believe that the leadership shown by Dr. William Keyes and, um, and the president was, was what this country needed. I know there's a lot of negative, there's a, a huge amount of negative um, perception, from, especially from the private sector, because people are under enormous economic pressure. I'm not denying that at all. It's an extremely difficult situation. But if you consider South Africa's situation, um, where we have many, many people who aren't close to or don't have uh, health care, for example, who don't have the, you know, the, the ability to just drive up to the clinic or drive up to the hospital and deal with the situation. Um, people who have to rely on public transport all the time. They, don't, they can't sit in their safe car and drive around. They, um, I do think that I believe that the right, the right approach was taken. And as you said, they were lauded for their approach. Now, of course, where there's a possibility of a second wave, but the economy is under enormous pressure, now the real, the really, really tough decision happens. You know, can, can they even afford to lock down further? I think that's slightly off the topic, but I, I believe the leadership that was shown was very good. And I believe that the, the powers that were afforded the president 
at that time were, were correct. Now, the, I think what you're asking is, can Parliament say, well, we're in a similar state. You know, we're in a similar situation if, um, in this situation. But I, I guess the problem is that now the referee is the player. The people within the corridors of power are the ones that are um, holding the purse strings and the ones who, some of whom are, who are being revealed to having their hands in the till. Whereas the other situation, it was an external enemy, everyone could point in the same direction and um, they could move forward on that basis based on medical um, information statistics and say, well, we're going to do ABC. I think it's slightly different because now you have a situation where the ANC is expected or the government is expected to police itself. It's unlikely they're going to bring down such uh, draconian measures upon themselves without a lot of soul searching and honesty. I think that's, that's really the heart of the matter is that you've got a situation where the, the power that is in the center hasn't hasn't really um, uh, the self-understanding or self-knowledge to, to police itself. That's really what's happened. Thank you. Bonan? I thought you said Mike before me, Vishal. No, I said we're closing with Mike, with the Bonan, oh. with you. Mike first. Okay. Thank you very much. So the, the government needs to be lauded on how they handled uh, the pandemic. In fact, you ask the central question, Vishal, because that's really in the heart of what we are talking about. So there were two components to it. It's about, it was about saving lives and preserving livelihoods. It was both and together at the same time, simultaneously, concurrently, in parallel, not either or. Mm. Because a society that laments more the loss of the economy than the loss of life does not need a virus. It is already sick. Three things that we should pay particular attention to moving forward to make sure that we use the learnings extracted from how we handled the pandemic. One is that Uhuru leaders that lead for 40, 50 years are not good for Africans. Therefore, respect for our constitution, which limits the terms to just two, is adequate. Number two, just because our leaders spent 27 years in Robben Island, we thought they're incorrigible, therefore uncorruptible. How wrong we were. In fact, today, you and I will struggle to find an upright ANC member that didn't accept money either from the asbestos audit or from the Busasa list or from VBS. Who's left standing? Lastly, I think moving forward, we made a mistake by extrapolating the skills of our leaders, politicians, not statesmen, in putting an AK-47 together in under three minutes in outfoxing a sitting National Party government in charge of intelligence and the army to then say, go and also run the more than 740 state-owned enterprises and state-owned companies. Imagine, as I conclude, you take one of those leaders in the cockpit of a Boeing 747-400, 388 passengers, 38 crew members, speed 980 kilometers, 15,000 kilometers between here and London Heathrow, 192,000 liters of fuel and say, take these people without any training whatsoever. But that's exactly what we did with education, outcome-based education. That's exactly what we did in healthcare. Now we put municipal managers and then after we say we must train them to know the difference between income and cash. And yet for the last 340 years, you could never sign off on a management set of accounts unless you are a CASA. Thank you. Thank you, Bonang. We're gonna we, thank you very much, uh, panelists. One last uh, parting shot, one minute, please, per person. We've come to the end of our discussion, and I think we'll go. We'll enter into the Q and A just now, uh, which the which in Essentia will look after as program manager. But my last my last statement, and and I'll leave it for you to to say what you'd like to say about it. At this time, we are we are on the cusp of of or, or I call it an inflection point. We have the power and the resilience to fix and make things right. But we also have within ourselves the power to destroy it completely. What are your comments on 
on whether we are at an inflection point uh, uh, of, of, of that sort. One minute each and then we, we go to Q&A. Thank you. Can I start? Should I start? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I want to have to speak really quickly because I've got quite a lot to say. But I, so I think the cons that we, I believe we are an inflection point. I think we are under enormous pressure, specifically economically. Um, but I think there's a danger that when people get desperate, they make bad decisions. So that's whether that's in the public or private sector. And I, I think we have, I believe we spent a lot of time um, maybe ANC bashing this evening, but I really don't think we should let the private sector off the hook. Um, they, aren't, they don't have it easy. I think that the, the environment is not easy for, for businesses, but honestly, there I know, and you've seen the list of, um, of companies that have been revealed to be unethical in their, in their you know, putting the bottom line first and really being involved in state catcher. And I, I've got a list actually in front of me of 20 companies. I'm not going to read them all out. Everyone knows who they are. They've come out in the Zondo Commission. They've had to give money back to ESCOM. They've had to do all sorts of things because they are um, they're just as rotten as some of the people that are in the public sector. So I think the main, the first thing to do, especially from our industry, is to lay the foundation. And uh, Professor Bonang mentioned, Professor Mahalib mentioned that, that the foundation is essential. You cannot make desperate decisions, bad decisions, short-term decisions in this time of difficulty. You need to lay the foundation properly. You need to be focusing on making good, long-term, sustainable decisions that lead to long-term business sustainability, ethical decisions that that result in, um, in the company being able to employ people over the next five years, over the next 10 years, not simply landing one project, not simply closing one deal that puts money in your pocket. People need to think long-term, they need to lay that foundation. And it's not easy because now the pressure's on. Can you even pay salaries? Can you even keep people employed? But you have to consistently and be making those right decisions. Otherwise, if there's no foundation like that, then eventually everything will fall to pieces. And it's no Thank brainer. You know, ethical business practices, they attract better employees. They're more profitable Thank in the long term. They are, uh, lead to higher morale, higher productivity of staff, and they build better brands as well as providing repeat business. So I think, to me, that's, that's an essential takeaway from this discussion. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mike, Greg um, has eaten up into your one minute. Okay. So I, I do think, again, we are at that inflection point. But I, I do think the good news um, and, the, and the good takeaway is that um, just after Nenegate, um, we had a situation where the president reached out to business in South Africa and engaged with the leaders of, of industry in South Africa. And a whole number of forums were set up, which has almost now culminated in a massive infrastructure commission being set up. In that, there is, um, for the first time in my 25 years of working, we saw um, a willingness by the ANC-led government to say to the private sector, come and help us do the things that you can do well. So what we saw for the first time was um, an attempt to engage. There, there are procurement methodologies. Our triple P regulations in South Africa, public-private partnership, Reg 16 type projects um, can be used to procure infrastructure on a proper scale. It means you have multiple eyes looking over a project. You have three sets of engineers, an owner's engineer, um, a shareholder's engineer, a lender's engineer, looking at a problem and saying this, before we make one cent of investment, is this the right technology to be procuring? Is this the right project to be procured? Is this going to have the economic outcome? So we have the technology in place. And now I think we need to be, everybody needs to be forcing government back to say we don't procure unless we adopt the, the right checks and balances. But, but this compact between government and the private sector is the enabling factor to my mind. The private sector, yes, it wants to make a profit, but making a profit is not wrong. It can be done ethically. And there are good institutions in South Africa that behave very ethically, but mostly it will get the job done. So a very quick example, we, we procured somewhere in the region of 112 big scale renewable energy projects in South Africa, procured by the Department of Energy um, under a procurement process. To date, and this is 250 billion rands worth of investment, the, there are almost no corruption cases connected to procurement on that scale. That has never been done before in the history of South Africa in the pure public sector. So it can be done. There are, met there are methodologies, and I, I do think the impetus now is really to say that's the way we've got to go. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged that the people are realizing that we, we, we've got our backs up against the wall, and, and maybe that's now a starting point. 
Thank you, Mike. So I think in, in what we can take from there is look at alternative procurement models that could assist rather than try and refine and reinvent the existing procurement model, which may be fallible. Uh, one hour, 30 seconds. Are we on the inflection point question? The answer is yes. And in supporting Mike and Greg, especially in the private sector, it's our only salvation. And we need to send a message strongly by our actions, not just by our words that business must continue to do well by doing good. Because business cannot continue to be an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty. When fisher women and fisher men can't go out to sea, they repair their nets. What are we as business going to do to repair our nets, to show that we have seen the precipice and we have pulled back and we are going to change our ways of doing business? Lastly, it's the stubbornly high levels of unemployment that lead to increasing levels of poverty and increasing levels of inequality. We must find the new common enemy like we did with apartheid. Maybe, just maybe, that new common enemy might be education, I don't know. Thank you.